Christ is in our midst, welcome to Spiritual Calisthenics. Today, on June 28th, we commemorate the finding of the relics of St. Cyrus and John, the Holy and Mercenaries, St. Sergius the Magister, St. Papias the Martyr, as well as the Righteous Fathers Sergius and Yermanos, the founders of Valam Monastery. So regarding the finding of the relics, these saints lived during the year of Diocletian. St. Cyrus was from Alexandria and St. John was from Edessa of Mesopotamia. Because of the persecution of that time, Cyrus fled to the Gulf of Arabia, where there was a small community of monks. John, who was a soldier, heard of Cyrus's fame and came to join him. Henceforth, they passed their life working every virtue and healing every illness and disease freely by the grace of Christ, hence their title of unmercenaries. They heard that there was a certain woman named Athanasia who had been apprehended together with her three daughters, Theodora, Theosisti, and Evdoxia, and taken to the tribunal for their confession of the faith. Fearing lest the tender young maidens be terrified by the torments and renounce Christ, they went to strengthen them in their contest in martyrdom. Therefore they too were seized. After Cyrus and John and those sacred women had been greatly tormented, all were beheaded in the year 292. Their tomb became a renowned shrine in Egypt and a place of universal pilgrimage. It was found in the area of the modern-day resort near Alexandria, near Abukir. Now, it's very important for us to recognize here of these two great holy men, that for them, they could have looked at their life and said, well, are we not doing good by healing people? We're unmercenaries. We're, we're doing miracles left and right. Why should we go and basically allow ourselves to be killed as martyrs for the sake of Athanasia and her three daughters. They saw comforting those four women as the most important job in their life, that everything else was important, certainly, but this was the most important, that they go and be with St. Athanasia and her three daughters. And that is the love of Christ. That is the self-sacrificial love that is necessary to be a great saint. Since you have given us the miracles of your holy martyrs as an invincible battlement, by their entreaties scatter the counsels of the heathen, O Christ our God, and strengthen the faith of the Orthodox Christians, since you alone are good and a friend of man. Regarding the holy righteous father Sergius and Yermanos, also known as Herman, the founders of our monastery, by their life and teachings, our righteous father Sergius and Herman did much to spread and confirm orthodoxy among the Carlian Finns, who had suffered much oppression on the hands of the Swedes of the Latin creed. They founded on Lake Lodoga the renowned monastery of Valam, which later became one of the chief centers of the monastic life. Both saints reposed about the year 1353. You appeared as true fulfillers of the gospel of Christ, living for the sake of Christ, as though the world and all therein did not exist. You settled on an island in the sea, whereon you struggled assiduously against the invisible foe, by fast, vigils, and all night standing, you wisely subjected your bodies to the Spirit. For this cause did you receive worthy crowns from the right hand of the Almighty One. And now, as you stand before the All-Holy Trinity, O Blessed Father, Sergius and Herman, pray that we be preserved in peace, that our souls be saved. Having left the worldly life, you did follow the steps of Christ, and having reached the great Lake Neva, you settled there on the island of Alam, and there you lived angelic lives. From thence you were translated, rejoicing in a heavenly bridal chamber. And now, as you stand with the angels before the throne of the Master, remember the children which you gathered so wisely, that we may joyfully cry unto you with all of our soul, Rejoice, most blessed Father Sergius and Herman. Continuing in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, Brethren, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but to do the very thing that I hate. How often does that happen to us, that we want to do good things, we want to be good, and yet we continuously mess up because we are carnal, we are fleshly. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. So then it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For if I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. So in other words, St. Paul is saying that sin is taking a boat in him and making him do sinful things. Now, this can almost become a scapegoat. People look at that, the idea of the idea, oh, the devil made me do it. 
Well, he's not saying that. He's about to, to clarify to say that doesn't make me less culpable. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, and make me captive to the law of sin, which dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I of myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. In other words, when we're only following our carnal desires just for good food or for um, uh, joys of the flesh, then we are not following after God. We are following after hedonism. We are following after the, the, the earth. And the body wants these things. It desires these things. Uh, and so we are not following after God, even though we want to. It's, it's like someone that wants to work out every day but finds it so, so difficult. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now, this is kind of hard for us to understand, but it's basically saying that we are not in control. And we try to force it with our will, but that's not working for us. That does not give us the results that we want. So we cannot force ourselves to be good. We have to do this with God. And so therefore, what we are really trying to do is acquire true free will. So you've probably seen those images of, of a devil and an angel both kind of telling you what to do. This is because we have free will as human beings, but it is limited. And so we are looking to be guided by either the flesh and evil, the little demon, or by our better angel, our guardian angel, and the saints, telling us what we ought to do, the good that we ought to do. And eventually, the goal is to become like Christ, who has set us free so that we can acquire the Holy Spirit, so that we no longer need people on either side telling us what to do. We of our own volition and of our own personhood will do what is right. Continuing with the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the Lord said to his disciples, Take no gold, nor silver, nor copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, no two tunics, no sandals, nor staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In other words, don't, don't bring anything. Don't be prepared, which is, seems counterintuitive, but he's trying to teach them to have faith in him. You're not going to need a, you're not gonna need spare clothes. You're not going to need a staff. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it. Stay with him until you depart. As you enter the house, salute it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it, the grace that is God's. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah for that town. Now keep in mind, Sodom and Gomorrah were towns that uh, fell into complete, utter licentiousness and sin, hedonism, the very things that St. Paul is talking about in his letter uh, to the Romans. And that's why these two are paired together. Because they gave over completely to sin and to their own desires, their own wills, uh, they were eventually destroyed. Now, to say that it would be better to be in Sodom and Gomorrah than to be for that house or town because they refused the peace that Christ gave them. Even mind, Jesus Christ as peace, he is the king of peace. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. Shalom, the greeting of the Israelites, literally means peace. But Christ says, I give you peace. Not as the world gives you peace do I give, but I give you peace. Because ultimately, we're, what are we trying to do? We're trying to cure anxiety. And where does anxiety come from? Anxiety comes from the enemy. And so when somebody refuses that peace, they want nothing to do with us. They want to stay in that anxiety. They want to stay in that crucible of pain and sorrow and suffering. And so there's nothing you can do for them. It'd be more tolerable to be in Sodom and Gomorrah with, hell, with hellfire raining down upon us uh, on the day of judgment than to be in that state, to be absent from peace, to be absent from Christ our God. Pray that none of us 
be absent from him, that he fill us with every good thing, that he may take away the anxiety that is in our hearts. I hope that you've enjoyed today's spiritual calisthenics. Have a blessed